Hello and welcome to our day two London Fashion Week review. I'm editor Hattie Malik. This is our fashion features editor, Joshua McGray. Hi. And this day was kind of all about womanhood and leaning into that idea of a glamorous, powerful woman. Um, we kicked off the day with 16 Arlington at the Barbican in their Curve Gallery, which kind of transformed for the very first time into a space for a fashion show. Um, if you think about kind of that charcoal -y kind of black um, space of kind of a theatre, that's kind of very much what this set was, but kind of in a kind of curved formation of us kind of seated with the runway curving around us. Um, and before the show started, we had these kind of spotlights in this very dark space. And then when the show kind of geared up, the lights were creating these silhouettes of people sitting down, the guests onto the walls. And it was kind of like shadow puppets, like the monsters you imagine from shadows when you're a kid. Marco, creative director, was thinking about monsters this season, um, specifically from an exhibition that he saw in 2019 um, by Charlie Fox called My Head is a Haunted House um, and thinking about different kind of um, meditations of horror, like everything from Frankenstein to Winona Ryder and Be Beetlejuice. Um, but these clothes weren't kind of, the clothes that came out weren't, weren't kind of cinematic iterations of those. It was very much this beautiful and powerful kind of, um, it kind of cemented this idea of the 16 Arlington woman, which Mark has really been developing and growing since his partner, who was co-creative director, sadly passed away just over a year ago, um, or maybe it was two, but um, it really felt like this empowered idea of womanhood, of glamour. Um, it really felt like Mark has reached this point where he's creating definitely like a brand which is gonna it's a kind of legacy brand like it's becoming a real part of the fabric of British fashion and it's also a rare thing to see a man dressing women in an intelligent way these are kind of glamorous and brilliant clothes from the opening black coat um, with this kind of iridescent shaggy bag detail this kind of shagginess which ran throughout the whole collection from kind of scarves to furry shoes in collaboration with Gina um, you know, from these winter coats through to organza kind of black gowns, um, look five in particular, a white skirt iteration in look 18. And then I love this kind of optical illusion print, um, kind of pointer list print, particularly in look 27. Um, mixed into that kind of idea of this kind of glamorous woman who also kind of wants the glamour for the daytime. We had these kind of oily faux leather pants in looks 23 and 24, which were kind of a deep purple and a turquoise and then closing out this collection with these kind of beautiful shimmering looks which were somewhere between tinsel mm -hmm. and feathers and it just felt completely refined clear idea of a woman it's, it's i just think 60 Arlington has reached such great heights and also i know women that wear these clothes marco makes these clothes for a range of sizes of women um, and it's it's not this fantasy of a no. woman, but it's a real woman can engage with this fantasy, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yeah, there's a real sleek humor this um, with this collection. And I think when I think 16 Arlington, I always think of play and um, mm. exuberance and that side of glamour. This time it felt quite restrained and it felt like anyone could yeah. enter into this world, especially with those tinsel looks, because there was the whole look but there was also like these tinsel scarves and these like really interesting um, styling tricks that added real dimension to everything that I thought was just mm. really fun. And then like there were also little elements kind of like the knitwear. There were a few men's mm -hmm. wear looks in this story then, but kind of knits with little dog motifs that kind of play that you were talking yeah. about. There was a lot of great texture. Yeah, serious amount of kind of texture, visceral feeling sense of the body, like the pattern cutting in this is incredible. Kind of some of those dresses with those kind of kind of always 1930s dropped hips. Um, just really, really beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it really set the tone for today with that idea of kind of womanhood and girlhood. I think mm -hmm. we should talk about it, but press release from Molly Goddard. And we've both got these kind of- Like a poster. Poster, which is, I guess, a kind of pin board of previous seasons and of fittings. Molly was saying that, you know, reiterating that every season they kind of go back to their own archive mm -hmm. and it's very much about playing and working with the body and fitting kind of using old patterns and reworking them that's kind of been what Molly 
did it's how since, the brand evolves yeah from CSA, when she was at CSM it was all about taking her kind of the patterns of her baby clothes and blowing them up so she's always had this affinity with working kind of with ideas of the body and thinking about how you can play with proportions and blow them up but um what did you think of this collection I loved it I thought it was really playful it tapped into this this girlhood idea that I think mm. culturally we're so ingrained in I mean girl dinner um Sandy Liang's bows and it's almost like Molly was positioning herself as what she is which is almost the progenitor of that for yeah um contemporary fashion like you said she blew up her kids clothes into adult size proportions and that is her design language and there was a lot of that here in the show note she talks about um ebay finds I love and that. there was a lot of western wear in this collection but it was the kind of like vintage children's western wear mm. that i tend to see when i'm scrolling through yeah. vintage online and i think if only they made that in my size because that is it's playful it's mm. irreverent it's fun and i think there's a lot of space right now in fashion for fun People want to feel that childish naivete when they get dressed. I know I do. I think it's also like, especially thinking about this kind of pin board idea, Molly's collections today and also always are always these elements of familiarity where mm. it's kind of references that you might have on your own mood board or scrolling on eBay and things that, yeah, things that you kind of, you know, from those kind of cowboy boots and cowboy wear that you mentioned to you know kind of whether it's a beautiful cardigan one with mm -hmm. this amazing taffeta skirt it's this idea of kind of play and dress up and yeah. that joy dress of dressing up, up. it was it, it felt like kids dressing up mm. in the best way possible it was it was how you can take these clothes and become something or make yourself mm. feel better or make yourself tackle the world in a way that you can mm. with other clothes and it just feels like every season it's like this is a brand molly wears herself it's mm -hmm. inspired directly by her friends and her what she wants to wear and fitting you know mm -hmm. that even going back to that idea of fitting going back to your archive and refitting stuff and reworking mm -hmm. it and reshaping it you look around you at the shows you also it's one of the brands that you know I'm walking around london at the weekend you see people wearing yeah, it and it's really it has a reality to it but it's yeah. also i love that something which is all about these enormous taffeta skirts, to put it yeah. really simply, is also so raw and about reality yeah. and about, you know, you you put on that big tall gown and you run around in your trainers all day, I love yeah. that. So um, with this collection, she also talks about how a lot of the research was around these haute couturiers, like mm. Christophe Balenciaga and Christian Dior, looking at how they played with sculptural silhouettes. Um, I would throw Christian Lacroix in there with those bubble hem skirts and this mm -hmm. like really heightened, super saturated like fuchsias and reds. Colors were fab. That were amazing. I was obsessed. Um, if we're thinking about silhouette as well, I think we should talk about Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they past. both looked at similar influences, mm. but skewed them in such distinct ways. So Erdem looked to the 20th century opera singer, Maria Callas, who even today is still one of the biggest style icons of the 50s and 60s. She was Actually, featured- look at this with the kind of opera gloves and opera coat. That's kind of, if you want to think about this Erdem yeah. collection, I think that's kind of it, right? Yeah. Um, she was featured heavily actually in the Victorian Albert's Diva exhibit last year. And really personified that idea of the diva. Um, someone who's immensely talented, someone who is a little temperamental, someone who is no stranger to scandal and controversy. And Maria Callas really embodied all of those things. But she was also a really influential style icon. She knew how to use fashion on and off stage to cultivate her mm. persona. Um, there's this real elevated, elegant, uptown 60s New York to her style that ran through this entire collection. I think it's really interesting to see that also, that idea if you think about kind of that uptown New York sensibility feeding into what we often consider to be a very British brand. You know, mm -hmm. this was set in the, the show was in the British Museum, but then we were in the Parthenon galleries. So it was kind of about these ideas of 
you know, Greek kind of myths and history and tragedy and yeah. Adam Garland, the hair was kind of done as if it was an off-duty actor, mm -hmm. so it was kind of like that they're meant to be wearing a wig and they've still got their kind of sound piece mic on the kind of headband yeah. of their hair. That old styling trick of face tapes yeah. to make you look like you've had a facelift. Yeah, so um, fab. But I thought that was done really well because when I think of, of the 60s and that style and that uptown New York woman, there's there's almost a pressure to live up to this ideal mm. of femininity. And having that as a styling trick with the face tapes circles it back to this idea of vulnerability. And I think Maria Callas really continues to be influential today because there was a lot of vulnerability throughout her life that people can connect to and resonate to. And I would say that about every diva, right? Yeah. If we, we, we put them on this, these impossible pedestals as the pinnacle of style and glamour and taste. But as society, we also love to tear them down when they've done something wrong. But the longevity of it is, we look at those stories and we connect with them because they are divine, mm. but they're also vulnerable. I think there's also something vulnerable about what Arden does. It's always mm. about this idea of glamour. You know, you always have these kind of opera coats you know, this season we had ostrich feather shoes, which oh you literally God, yeah. couldn't wear outside. <laughs> that it's like this, you know, and the, the fabrics, the embellishments, everything is so gorgeous and glamorous and ornate, but it never feels ostentatious in a snooty way no, at all. No, it feels so, I don't know, sentimental. Mm. It feels really sincere. It, there's like a sweetness to it. Mm. Um, and it does feel vulnerable. It, these clothes are, powerful in a different kind of way than a tailored, structured, sculptural Balenciaga look. There's there's such a softness to it. There's an emotion to them, and I think there was an emotion to all of these clothes that we saw on day two of London Fashion Week, that you can be glamorous, but you can still be vulnerable. And I think that's a really beautiful sentiment and a really nice way to kind of close off the day. Um, Josh is in a second going to magically disappear <laughs> and I'm going to come back to you from Simone Rocha and Richard Quinn. So that's why Josh is about to disappear. Bye guys, <laughs> I'll see you tomorrow. Hello and I am back. As you can see, Joshua has gone and left me um, and I'm coming to you having just left the Richard Quinn show and I want to talk to you about that show but also about Simone Rocha. Um, I think it's really interesting talking to you about these two shows, having started the day with Joshua and I talking to you about the idea of, in day one we were talking about the idea of coming into London Fashion Week, feeling quite bleak about fashion, and then actually feeling really excited by some of the kind of new designers that we're seeing, that being kind of the Central St. Martin's Graduate Show. Um, but I think it kind of brought to mind this idea, of, to me, of that I think people can often talk about London and say, you know, we don't have any legacy brands left. We've only got, really got Burberry and, you know, we've got some of our mainstays, but kind of London, you know, a lot of our designers have left and gone to Milan and gone to Paris. And actually I think sometimes it's worth looking at what's right under our nose because two designers, Simone and Richard, are really two of those designers who are gonna go down in the history books. Um, Simone, this was kind of her her closing of the trilogy um, of collections that she did, Spring, Summer 24. Her guest designer collection for Jean-Paul Gaultier Couture, which showed in Paris in January. And then this collection, um, which is called The Wake. Um, so the Gaultier collection was called The Procession and this is called The Wake. Um, it was very much a more elongated silhouette, but still part of the Simone Rocha world, which I think we've really seen become more elevated. Simone's always been incredibly elevated from everything kind of from craft down to her idea of, of a woman, this kind of tough femininity, finding, you know, earlier Josh and I were talking a lot about the idea of vulnerability and finding power in that. And Simone really is the best at doing that. Um, but this collection was about kind of any longer silhouette, but about kind of honing back to some of Simone's earliest work. I think we saw that at the Gaultier collection as well, the kind of return of the graduate collection, Perspex Heel. Um, in this collection, we had more of that, but I think what the key to that Perspex Heel is the visceral, visceral feeling of it. And um, the kind of 
the kitsch nature of it, the kind of fetish to it as well. Um, and that was something which really ran throughout this collection with a lot of kind of faux furs in this, the kind of faux hide shoes, um, the faux fur kind of capes with massive bows at the side, um, the fur trims on the sheer jackets, skirts, the sheer dresses with the pockets, um, you know, bringing fur into this kind of, yeah, this fetishistic kind of element to elevating and playing with the idea of the delicate the strength and delicacy that Simone always is so kind of skilled at playing with um if you think about that first spring summer 24 collection it was a lot of kind of ideas of tracksuit of drawstring a continuation from the Montclair collaboration that Simone did and it was nice to kind of thread back to that in this collection with the odd kind of drawstring but that would kind of be tied into corset tree um, blow, very, very blown up shell jackets that kind of became sculptural couture kind of gowns rather than kind of tracksuit jackets. Um, going back to that faux fur, those kind of big kind of coats were very regal, definitely ties into the idea of regal dress. Simone was actually looking at morning dress, particularly um, of Queen Victoria. She was, she went and looked at Queen Victoria's morning dress at, um, at Hampton Court um, and it's it, you know it's in this church setting Simone creates this whole kind of world for you um, head to kind of toe um, and it just tied together this this idea that we, I think we've been seeing Simone progress through where she's really finding new ways to push herself you know it, this brand is you know around 10 years been around for kind of 10 years or so it's a real kind of pull on the London schedule rightly so it's kind of it's become a real staple Simone's always had such a strong sense of identity and what she wants to say with her clothes so it's really exciting for someone that has such a kind of staple aesthetic to still be finding ways to redefine that and push it forward and challenge herself as a designer and challenge us as whether you're looking at this as buyers or critics, but mostly as kind of wearers, you know, earlier I was talking about glamour and women and the idea of clothes that give you strength. And there's such a strength in Simone's work. When you look at it as a woman looking at it, you want to wear these clothes. They have such an inherent power to them. Um, and there was men's in this as well. You know, Simone introduced men's about so I want to say three seasons ago off the top of my head um, we had menswear in that spring summer 24 kind of book first bookend of this triptych and then we had menswear again in this collection kind of brought in in kind of the third quarter of this collection but singing in absolute harmony with the women's wear um, you know this this collection as I mentioned was called um, The Wake it was very much about mourning so a massive part of this collection was kind of really dark inky blacks and blues but kind of and that kind of took up most of the menswear, but it kind of, you know, it just, it all fed in together and it feels so seamless from everything to the amazing hair from Eugene Suleiman, which was kind of, the hair was curled around the ears. It was meant to be as if these women and these men had literally been kind of woken up from their kind of tombs and graves and kind of Simone's signature kind of crystals. You can see I'm wearing some hair, I kind of, kind of pearls and crystals and iridescent kind of ultra feminine features and then kind of and bedazzlement is kind of then threaded into these more kind of somber themes and that idea of kind of contrast and play is something that Simone does so well. Um, Richard Quinn, again, you know, a mainstay, a staple of London and someone that is who we're going to kind of remember London fashion by for the for this kind of period in time and hopefully for a long time to come. Um, Richard's really incredible because what he does and what he's kind of developed his brand into is so aware of its client and it has such a devoted client and you know Richard became really well known for his prints. He has a print studio in Peckham where he still kind of creates a lot of his stuff and his, it's really interesting to see that kind of you know if you look back at those early collections which were kind of the full body suits and the skirts and the dresses that became so influential for a lot of fashion with these kind of um, slightly glitchy floral prints. It's interesting to see them now threaded into this 
kind of developed and matured idea of the Richard Quinn woman. Kind of those are threaded in with these very, again, you know, Josh was talking about the influence of kind of mid-century couture on designers. You could see that in this collection. And it's interesting to see those kind of Richard Quinn tropes threaded into that to these kind of beautiful, exquisite dresses which have these couture kind of silhouettes to them. And, you know, we're housed within this carpeted room in the style of almost an old salon with these meters upon meters of fabrics hanging from the walls in the kind of Richard Quinn staple floral print. Um, I think it's worth mentioning, I was just standing outside after I got out of the show and I met this lovely woman who actually owns the company Ziri Embroideries and she was saying it's the first time she'd been to the show and actually seen some of some of the work that they do in person. You know, if we're thinking about heritage brands and staple brands, what Richard Dundas does is so beautiful because he has this print studio in Peckham. He works with these embroidery houses the level of finish is absolutely exquisite and undeniable, you know, from the kind of huge wedding dress section in this. Again, you can sense the kind of the client to, you know, you've got shorter kind of mini silhouettes and you've got, you know, kind of strap, these strapless kind of couture dresses. And then you've got kind of more playful beaded full body suits. So there's someone for kind of that complete age range of client, but he kind of said in the notes that he wants, it was about mentioning the idea of mothers and daughters. So this idea of passing something down and you can definitely feel how he is setting, setting that up um, for the Richard Quinn brand. Um, so feeling very, very hopeful today for London fashion um, after what we've seen today. Um, so go and have a look at the shows if you haven't already and we will see you next time. Thank you, bye.